All right, I'm Jan. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Braving this cold weather. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about bike packing, but obviously it comes from mountain biking and it comes from gravel. So how many of you have been out on a ride and had such an amazing time that you did not want the day to end, right? So imagine doing that and then camping out and then doing it again and then camping out and then doing it again. Um, first of all, who knows what bikepacking is? What do you think it is? What do you think it is? It's backpacking with a bike, essentially. That's a good, a good way to describe it. That's how I've described it to a lot of people, too. So what kind of bike do you need for bikepacking? What do you think? Anyone? Any bike that you can mount. Basically. Any yeah. bike. Whatever bike you have, you can use for bikepacking. This is an easy crap. <laughs> so bikepacking doesn't have to be on dirt. I know a lot of people want to say that bikepacking is only single track or only this kind of riding or whatever. Ride what you have, load your bike. Technically, you could call touring bikepacking. Um, to me, just go out and adventure on your bike. Um, for when I was in Baja and Cuba, I'd have a mountain bike for that because the, the trails are really rough and I need to be able to carry a lot of stuff with me. So this is a pretty light load. Um, it's still the same as what I'd take for those trips, but on those trips I needed to be able to carry three days of food and water, for instance. So that's going to really load you down and need a lot more room. Does anyone have any questions about bike packing in general? Like anything on that? No? Okay. Is it still bike packing you just stay in the yeah, credit card packing. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. I've done that plenty of times on a ride. Uh, you know, Who sitting... likes a comfortable bed? Yeah, yeah. Right? I've, I've definitely had nights where, you know what, I just really want to lay in bed tonight and watch TV, not think about it. <laughs> Order pizza to the room and we're good. Um, so yeah, I do, uh, Kevin and I have started uh, working together a little bit on some guided trips too. So. Uh, I think we're going to talk about that here a little later after I go over kind of my stuff. So if you're interested in that and some guided trips here locally, um, definitely talk to us. Uh, we can get you up on that. Would you like me to go through my gear? Does that, would that help kind of answer a lot yes. of questions? Okay. When you go through the gear, you start out with kind of like, here's where you should start, the basics to do it. And then to the thing that, well, this is kind of a luxury. Right, so I have pretty much just basics here, okay. uh, but that's pretty much what I travel with. Okay. The only thing that I didn't pack here is I have a little folding chair that weighs a pound. Um, and for a lot of people, that's like an extreme luxury. But at the end of a 100 mile day on gravel, like I just want to sit in a chair. <laughs> I don't want to have to sit Indian style on the ground, but you know, it, it varies for everyone. Um, so we have your tail bag. We have your front roll here, and then you'll have like a pocket on the front usually that is for food. These are called, generally called feed bags, so you can either put food in here. I tend to travel with water bottles. This is where I'll keep like, uh, like my mixes, my uh, electrolytes, stuff like that. Um, and then your top tube bag here, this will be like quick snack food, maybe your phones, and cables if you want. Um, sometimes you'll have a, a bag that goes here, generally like a jerry can type. Um, and I, I generally only do those when I'm on really long trips. Uh, and then your frame bag here, um, generally you'll carry water in here. Um, I will, on certain trips, this is where I'll carry a water filter and water treatment. I'll have my first aid kit in here, um, and maybe my toiletry bag in here as well. Yeah. So. And then you were noticing my safety triangle. Um, just little things like that. I don't have to worry so much if my tail light goes out. I'm still, people can see me. Uh, so we'll unpack here. First things, uh, just this is my rain gear. So I don't use cycling specific rain gear. You're gonna sweat in any rain gear and you're gonna get soaked. So it's kind of useless. My goal for rain gear is that it's thick enough to block the wind and retain some heat. So if I'm wet and I'm hot, it's fine. But if I'm wet and I'm cold, my day is done. So this is actually gear that's designed for uh, climbing. I cook. I really like to cook on my trips. <laughs> I know there's a lot of people that live off of gas station food. 
<laughs> but after a week of that, you, you, it doesn't work for me. So this is just you know a little pot that I have. Uh, it's good for coffee, good for stuff like that. Um, I can get into a lot of detail on, on cookware and stuff like that. So this one uses uh, just these little fuel tabs. And you can get these also, a, a version of these at Walmart, which means they're easily accessible really anywhere in the US. When you're trying to cover big miles, the, the weight of your gear really does matter. If you're doing, if you're just getting started, I don't suggest going out and buying the lightest gear you can find because it's a trial and error process. You're gonna, whatever works for me, whatever I can sleep on, I guarantee you maybe you can't sleep on it. So this is my sleeping pad. Uh, this pad is good down to, I think, negative 15. Um, I don't camp in that. <laughs> but yeah, this is pretty much it. And it blows up. This is one of the things most people have told me they really like seeing. It blows up via this bag. So you're not at the end of a long day puffing into this and then putting all the moisture from your air in here that will never get out. And you just, especially if you're outside, put this over the end. If the wind is blowing, it's a lot easier, but, you know, so you just kind of do that and then just start airing it up. So, in addition, this acts as a, a layer of protection for your sleeping pad, right, when it's stored. Additionally, when you're in your tent, you can put all your clothes in here and then use it as a pillow if you want. I tend to really focus on items that don't have just a single use. There are some things in the sleeping pad um, that's, that's critical. But I like things when I'm looking for my gear and looking to buy certain gear. How, how can I use this for more than this one? Like, this is not just an inflator bag. It's a storage bag and a pillow, right? So I'm going to carry it, and it's going to take up space. It needs to do more than one thing. And the other thing to remember is that your sleeping pad the most crucial thing to keeping you warm. Everyone focuses on a sleeping bag. But the problem is when you're on your pad, that whole bottom side of the sleeping bag is compressed. So it's doing nothing to insulate you. So this pad here, it's one of the reasons it's good down so cold because it has layers of insulation in it that helps reflect your body heat. So don't skimp on that. That's the biggest thing I can tell you. Don't skimp on it. I can have my 35 degree bag and if it's 50 degrees out and I don't have an insulated pad, I'm cold. I can sleep on that pad with a 30 degree bag down to about 20 degrees and it's fine. Um, all right, so this is my tent body and my tent fly right here. This is a one person tent, ultra light. It weighs one pound, seven ounces. It is not very durable. You start getting into the super lightweight stuff, you start losing durability, and the price starts going up, right? So there's that triangle of cost, weight, durability, you can't really have all three. So when you're looking for a tent, like I said, this is a one-person tent. I know a lot of people, maybe if you don't camp a whole lot, you're like, how is that a one-person tent? You gotta remember that all you're doing is sleeping in it. You may sit in it in some bad weather. Um, so, the material here is super lightweight. When you start getting into the heavier tents, you generally have more durable material. So if you're going to be kind of rough on your gear, consider getting maybe a little bit heavier material for that. Um, I do also recommend if you're first time camping, first time buying this gear, don't buy, don't go out and just buy the lightest weight thing. Fine. So on my bike, um, because I'm smaller uh, and this bike is a drop bar bike, I end up keeping my tent poles here. So, and if you have a full suspension bike, you can do this. <laughs> With this fork, it's fine. Uh, I, I have tested it and checked it. So I do use a footprint with this tent. The, that's the other thing with a heavy duty tent, a heavier tent, you may not need a footprint. So here's my tent poles right here, and then just, I took the tent, traced out a footprint, pretty dirty, that's it, that's my footprint, 
and I wrap my poles in it, store it there, it helps protect them. And, and yes, so it, it, this uh, footprint protects the bottom of your tent, but more importantly, it protects your sleeping pad. Last thing you want is, oh, I don't need this footprint, and then go put your sleeping pad down and get a thorn in the tent, and then in your sleeping pad, and you wake up two hours later and you're on the ground. I run a generator hub on the front here. So I've got a headlight that connects to it, so I don't have to worry about charging a headlight. And then I've got a USB port here. So when I'm gone for days outside of civilization, don't have access to electricity, I can charge my devices while I ride. However, it's slow. <laughs> it's kind of like a backup thing. So I buy a two port wall outlet. It's tiny. And I do a two port because then I can charge my phone and my Garmin, or my phone and my battery backup but I also make sure it's a higher amperage. So the little uh, iPhone plugs are like one amp, and it'll take forever. So this is a 2.4 amp, so it's just a little trick that I've learned. And if you're out with friends, you know, and you go into a restaurant or wherever and you plug in, suddenly they can't charge because you're taking up the port. So this, just a, a little tip there. Um, this company, Fossils, it's like flat pack but it turns into, I use this as a cutting board if needed. And they make, this comes in a three pack. So this is the little bowl or the cup. It doubles as a cutting board if I'm prepping food. If you're going to be eating on the bike, and many people do the, the dehydrated meals where you just pour water in, um, get the long spoon <laughs> because otherwise you're going to have food when you dip into the bag all over. So just a little tip there. Um, toothbrush carries toothpaste in the bottom that you can refill. Um, tent stakes. So the tent stakes that come with your tent are pretty good. Um, I go, I have different types of tent stakes and I thought I'd put them all in here. So these are a little more durable. I can take a rock and hit the head of this and get it down in some really hard dirt. They're titanium. If it's really rocky, they're not gonna bend on me. That's the one thing you have to watch out for with the tent stakes that come with the tent. They're aluminum, they're, they're cheap. Um, they will bend and they will break. So stick with it at first, you'll be fine. If you start going to different places, you want to start looking at different style tent stakes. If you're going to be uh, in a sandy area or a really muddy area, look at, it's a snow tent stake. So it's a, a bigger, wider tent stake and has holes in it so that when you put it in the ground and in the sand, it doesn't, it, it doesn't just slide out. Um, that may or may not be an issue. Uh, on that note, for anyone that does already own a tent or buys a tent and they're not sure what this is for. Does anyone know what this is for? Yeah, to splint your tent pole. I've seen a lot of people that just don't even bother taking this with them because it's extra. And then their storm comes in and their tent pole snaps and they're, what do they do? Take this with you. That's when the tent becomes a vivid. I'm sorry? That's when the tent becomes a vivid. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, headlamp. So depending on what you're doing, if you're going to be doing like some single track up in Arkansas and you think you might be riding at night, you're going to want a, a better headlamp in addition to a, a handlebar mounted so that you can turn and look and see where you're going. The red or the green. So when you're eating and you have this thing on your head and you've got your food and you've got the white light on, it's going to attract every bug that is out there. When you do the red or the green, it doesn't attract the bugs. Plus the different, the red and green uh, doesn't hinder your night vision. Also look at how it charges, or if it uses batteries, or if it you know charges normally. So like I try to make sure all of my devices use the same style plug, which can be an issue. I don't want to carry 15 cables with me. One of the primary, most important things for cooler weather riding is a good puffy, period. Um, it will, keep you warm, a good non-down puffy you can ride in and sweat in. So it's something to consider with a sleeping bag too. If down gets wet, it's useless. It, it takes forever to dry, 
unless you dry it in a dryer for like six hours, it won't fluff back up. So a synthetic puppy is really important. The other thing is I will do this layered with my rain jacket on top for cold nights because the rain jacket blocks the wind and it helps retain some heat. Now I will also, in really insect ridden areas, I'll just put on my rain gear and not bother with bug spray. So the thing with that is you put bug spray on and then you go to get in your sleeping bag. And the many times the beat in the bug sprays will just eat through some of this material. Long johns, socks. These are not riding socks. They will never go on your feet when you are on the bike. In fact, I really suggest storing these with your sleeping bag, in, in the thing with your sleeping bag. Um, if your feet get wet, this is something from the, the wilderness first aid class, if your feet get wet and it's cold, you're done. But also when you're in your sleeping bag, like it sucks to have cold feet if you can't sleep. <laughs> so that's why these come in. And then I just go with, depending on where I'm going, just some mid-weight long johns. Um, I like to wear full coverage in my sleeping bag because again, if I haven't been able to shower for a few days and I get in my bag, it's gonna get nasty. So this is my sleeping bag. This is a 35 degree bag. It's down. Um, you don't have to store it in a bag like this. If your gear is big enough, you can just shove it in there. So there's a few different options on sleeping bags. Down is the warmest, the lightest, and the most expensive. Synthetic is bulky. Uh, it can still be just as warm, but it's cheaper. Again, um, with down, if it gets wet, you're kind of out of luck. With synthetic, generally, if it's wet, it'll still keep you warm. Um, so yeah, that's it. Weigh the pound. There's also quilt. How many of you have heard of quilts for a sleeping bag? Yeah. So I bought this when I first started out. I just found a 10 degree quilt someone was selling. I'm done. Quilts. <laughs> Go with a quilt. So the, the difference is, whereas this lays on top of your sleeping pad, right? The nice thing is I could, I can kind of convert this to a quilt. So I'll take this, put, put the sleeping pad in here and then take the bag and kind of wrap it around the sleeping pad. So the difference here is you don't have drafts, right? The bottom of the sleeping pad or bag, like I mentioned, is going to be compressed and useless anyways. So why have it, right? Additionally, by keeping the sleeping pad insulated, it stays even warmer. This is my toolkit in here. Um, I could go into a lot of detail on a toolkit. Basically, when you're first starting out, you're not going to be going to really remote places. You shouldn't be yet. Um, what, think about what you would carry for a long day on the bike, right? If you're just doing a loop, if you're doing an out and back, that would be what I would start with. Uh, I run tubeless, which I really recommend. So I carry you know, some extra stands. Um, I do carry like an extra CO2 cartridge just to maybe help seat the tire on the rim because a, a frame pump is not gonna do that. I didn't show my frame pump. Carry a pair of tweezers. This can also be a first aid thing, but if you have thorns, who knows? Um, so this is a wolf's tooth chain tool right here. If you need to pull the chain off to fix it, and then it also has some master links in here. So the number one thing, and we've talked about this, if you don't know how to do something on the bike, you don't need to carry the tool with you. There's just no reason for it. Um, if you are gonna be on a trip with other people who might know how to do it, then yeah, carry the tool. But if you don't know how to use the tool, it's gonna just frustrate you. You're, you're, you're gonna end up in a lot, other, a lot of other problems. So this tool also has for the valves, to be able to pull the valve core on a tubeless uh, set up that's here so that's something you need and all the guys at the bike shop will definitely be able to help you figure that out what you need um, and the right tools for the job extra so the, the little thing for the co2 extra valves themselves because you never know when you might 
you know, tear the rubber on this or bend the valve. These also include the extra cores, so that's something to consider. An extra derailleur hanger, always. Uh, you can be as careful as you want to be. I was two days from the end of the Pony Express. I had not had a single mechanical. I was tired. I leaned my bike up. A gust of wind came, bent my derailleur, or <laughs> the derailleur hanger. Luckily, I was able to get it fixed, but if I didn't have this and that had happened, you know, 200 miles out in the middle of nowhere, I'm going to be cussing my chain, making so much noise because everything's grinding, and then I'm doing extra wear and tear uh, on the bike. Um, I carry just an extra toothbrush head because about every three days, I really like to give my chain a good just scrubbing. So the number one thing that I, I have that I, I really try to follow is a clean bike is a reliable bike. So I know it's hard to think about cleaning your bike adequately when you're out in the middle of nowhere. You can figure out a way to get it, at least get the, the layer of grime off. And if you can do that on a regular basis, the bike will be more reliable. I carry a little tube of E6000, uh, which is, it's a glue, but it's not like super glue in that it's drying up real fast. It's great for if you have a sole of a shoe start to come off or you know, a seam on the tent that's no longer waterproof. This stuff will make it waterproof. So there's that. Uh, a little bit of tape. This is Gorilla Tape. This is also the same width you use to seal up a, a tire or a, a rim to make it tubeless compatible. Um, I just wrap it around itself. A lot of people will put it on their frame pump and then put their frame pump on the outside and then it's nasty and it's kind of useless and it's in the elements. So I've, that's why I kind of put it in a little bag here. Um, a plug kit, I actually had to use, use one of these down in uh, Big Bend earlier this year. So it's just like a, tar, a, a car plug kit. You have this little strip here, it's kind of gooey. If you have a thorn in, in the tire, I don't recommend it for the sidewalls, guys. Yeah, um, so in the, in the tread, if in, a, in an emergency, sure, <laughs> but in the tread, you just kind of take this thing, put it in there, fold it, and just start, shove it down the hole and pull it out and hope the best, basically. <laughs> you sh it, they work really well. They really do. Uh, yes, yeah, do it as soon as you see that. And on that note, if you are riding and you're riding tubeless, don't pull the thorn. Just keep riding with it. If you are losing air rapidly, then you know, you're gonna have to pull it and plug it. But that thorn, it's, it's plugging the tire. So I've seen that happen a few times. Um, it's, it's hard, it's hard to not want to pull it out. Um, this is just some little gooey patches that'll come with like your, your uh, sleeping pad. So to help seal it if something happens. Um, this is like tenacious tape. It's like a cloth tape. So I have had it happen where, uh, not on this bag, but on some other bags, it'll start drooping and I won't know it. And I rub the hole in the bottom of the bag on the tire. That's where this stuff comes in. Or uh, my tent fly, I got a cotton zipper, ripped it a little bit. That's where this stuff comes in. Uh, some tire boots. I don't really know how useful this would be with a, all the slime in there, but you know, I use this, I would use that with, potentially, floss and a curved heavy duty needle, like you would use for uh, leather work. Mm. And you can find these at Joann's or Michael's. But I do the floss because I like floss, but it'll double as a thread. So I, in Baja, we had an instance where a guy slashed the sidewall. He uh, used floss and thread, sewed it up, and then we used some uh, glue on the outside, put the E6000 on the outside, and then took a bunch of sand and put it on there to try and help, you know, coagulate. And he rode the rest of Baja like that. Rode another Tubeless. thousand miles. Hmm? Tubeless? Tubeless. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I've had an issue where it was like a nail and I had to pull it from the tire uh -huh. and it wouldn't, wouldn't clog up. I was sort of riding and the dirt sealed it up. Yeah. Sometimes that's all you got to do is just keep riding. Yeah, yeah. So with, if the, the, wherever the thorn is, when you pull that, if you're riding tubeless, put that at the bottom so that the 
the slime and stuff can seal it. Don't leave it up here because it won't seal. Um, and then just some basics, uh, safety pins, because they always come in handy. I carry just a little extra link of chain. Um, actually, in Baja, we had one of the guys that, you know, that this center part just disappeared on him. And suddenly his bike was riding like crap. And so we had to just put in a little link of chain and the two master links, and everything was fine. And then these are like 49 cents. It is an adapter for your tire so that if you are out somewhere and you need this, like for me, if I needed to seat a tire, I could go to a gas station or a auto parts or an auto store and this will allow me to use their air compressor. So, and that is literally it. So the, the most detailed stuff is in the toolkit. But yeah, you, the main thing is you need shelter. So a tent or a bivy or a tarp or a hammock. Um, you need something to sleep on. So a sleeping pad and sleeping bag. And then maybe some warm clothes for the end of the day for just a basic trip, right? So, like, we, and a bike, yes, you need a bike. <laughs> Whatever bike you have, but a gravel bike is pretty nice because they're designed to handle a little more weight. And, well, I'd say a gravel bike. Yeah. Many gravel bikes are designed to handle a little more weight, the rubber terrain. Um, so, yeah. And we've got some trips coming up, um, some guided trips. So, for that, we do have, uh, like, Kevin has here the, the gear that you can rent. Um, there's just not much you need for these these intro trips because you can just run to the convenience store and grab a sandwich for your meal. You don't need a cook set, you know. So this is pretty much the gear that I run for every trip I do. What kind of shoes do you use? Uh, I use the Shimano XC5s. Uh, they're just, they fit my foot, they're comfortable. Um, I really like the sole on them mm -hmm. for walking around, yeah, you know. That was my next question. Yeah. Or hike a bike, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, hopping it up a, a mountain mm -hmm. where it's suddenly at 22%, um, and just walking around in the grocery store, yeah. you know. So, yeah. um, I do sometimes. So, if I'm going to say state parks, I don't like going in those showers barefoot. So, a little trick, and I actually didn't, I had to throw them away. If you go get a pedicure, yes. Yes. Get those, yes. <laughs> right there. those with you, uh -huh. and it helps keep things light that way. Um, otherwise, I do have like a pair of water shoes for longer trips. If I think I'm going to have to do some water crossings, and I don't want to get my shoes and socks soaked, then I'll put those on. Um, and at the end of, the, of a long day, weeks at a time, I want my feet to breathe. So yeah, camp shoes are definitely an option. Wearing the same clothes every day for a week, month. I do. I do. Yes, yes, five. At the end of those long days, push me out of those clothes. Yes, yes. So that's why I have the long johns, right? Um, so you're either in your kid or in your camp? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it kind of depends on what I'm doing. I'm, I'm a big fan of like baggies because um, I can walk around in a grocery store and not get stared at in the middle of Kansas, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Um, and at the end of the long day, I can take the, the shorts, the undershorts off, the chamois off, and just yes. wear the shorts, too. Um, but yeah, and the, the big thing there for me is learning to live on the bike without chamois cream. Because mm -hmm. five days of putting chamois cream in, yeah. it's not good. <laughs> 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 so tips for avoiding saddle sores. Get, get a professional fit. Number one, come see these guys and have them fit you on your bike. Um, number two, a good chamois. A, a good high quality chamois and one that you have put time in on. It doesn't have to be a $300 chamois, it, but you need to know, you need to put time in on it um, because what works at 40 miles may not work at 100 miles. And then the saddle, uh, but that's part of a professional fit, honestly. Yeah. When you go to a grocery store, do you buy your bike? What do you do with that bike? Kind of depends on where I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, we carry along. I have an auto lock, oh. so I generally try to pick where I stop. 
if I'm if I am not going to lock the bike up to where I can see the bike the whole time. So like if I'm in a restaurant, I'll ask for the table by the window. I'll have a, a, a water bladder in here, a three liter water bladder. Um, I have the here that I can do two water bottles on like on the Pony Express and in Baja. Um, uh, this fork's a little different. Um, I have a, a cage mount that I can put on here, but like on a suspension fork, you just use hose clamps and mount, you know, uh, cage that, put it in there. Uh, I do filter. Um, I try to avoid it just because there's always something that can go wrong. <laughs> but uh, any, any water source outside of something that I am absolutely positive, I will filter and treat. So that, that's another point of when people ask me, what do you do if something goes wrong? Well, I don't need it to be perfect, right? I need to get to help. So that, if that helps kind of alleviate some of the fear, keep that in mind. You don't, you know, I, I'm not an expert bike mechanic, but I can generally fix the bike enough to get me down the road to a town or to help. Anything else? Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Are you going to tour the bike again? Uh, eventually, like? maybe. <laughs> I don't handle the cold real well. Um, and the tour divide is cold, lots of cold. And that's kind of why I've gone on the Express, Baja, Cuba. <laughs> it's started to do a lot of desert riding. That's the Sun Generator Hub. Okay. Yeah, the SON Generator Hub. Thank y'all very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.